Okay, we know that for most situations, we don't store charge with a capacitor, right? Most of our devices run on batteries. And it turns out that a battery uses chemistry to create that potential difference, not really physics. So we're not going to get into a whole bunch of the details about exactly how a battery works. Um, for us, a battery is just a source of potential. Now, why do we use batteries instead of capacitors? Honestly, in many ways, capacitors would be better. And the answer is, it's because you can store much more energy per kilogram of a battery than you can energy per kilogram of a capacitor with current uh, technology. Now, <clears throat> if you could use a capacitor to store energy to run your electric car on, it would be much quicker to charge. Batteries have a large internal resistance, and we know that resistance creates heat. Um, and so, if you try and charge your electric car too fast, then your battery could overheat and start a fire. If you had a capacitor, though, capacitors can have negligible internal resistance. So if you were able to store enough energy to run your car with a capacitor, you could charge it as fast as you could fill your gas tank. So, um, you know, that could be a real breakthrough if we ever uh, get capacitor technology to where it can compete on an energy storage per pound basis. That's why batteries are winning right now. I suspect someday uh, somebody will invent a capacitor that will be able to store a comparable amount of energy per pound, and I suspect that it will create a real revolution um, in our electrical devices. We'll see. I might be wrong. Okay, uh, so at any rate, a capacitor runs out of charge, but a wire connecting the terminals of a battery can keep charges in motion. Again, you can store a lot of energy in a battery. For our sake, for the sake of this class, a battery is a source of constant potential. And again, we see the same thing with the battery that we saw with the capacitor. We can light a light bulb and a compass needle gets deflected if we connect our wire between the two terminals of a battery. So it must be creating a current. Now what happens inside a battery, we can visualize it as a charge escalator. Just like when you get on an escalator, you stand there and your potential energy increases. That's exactly what happens to a charge when it enters a battery. If a positive charge was to enter down here, it would go on this battery, uh, on this charge escalator, and it would have its potential energy increased until it left the top of the battery. And then the charge falls downhill, again, building up this analogy of potential is like height in an electrical landscape. It falls downhill, releasing that energy as thermal energy, and doing something useful if you put a light bulb in there. So again, a, the point of a battery really is to increase the potential energy of charges so that you can use that energy for something useful. Now notice that a battery does not get depleted of charge. That's sort of weird to think about because for every positive charge that leaves the top, another positive charge enters here. Well, we know it's actually electrons moving, so for every negative charge that leaves the negative side, a negative enters the positive side. Sort of weird. We're not really getting charge from a battery. You're really getting energy from a battery. Here's a quick example. Here's three batteries. They're connected one after another. So we're stacked like this. And the word for this is in series. If the current has to go through one in order to get to the next one, that relationship is defined as in series. More on that in the next chapter. So if each one of these batteries creates 1.5 volts of potential difference, if we stack three of them up, what's our total potential difference? And we haven't discussed this in lecture, so I don't know, think about it, make a guess, and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, so indeed, these do add. So because they are in series, these potentials add. And, and we can kind of wrap our brains around that, thinking about the escalator. Right? If we ride an escalator up 1.5 volts here, well, that becomes the new base for this. So. We wrote our escalator 1.5 volts here, and then we write it another one 1.5 volts. Well, at this point, we are 3 volts above where we started. Another 1.5 volts gets us 4.5 volts above where we started. So again, a battery is a source of potential difference. Here are three different types of battery. This is an alkaline battery, uh, lead acid battery, and a lithium ion battery. Different chemistry, same thing, in the sense that the battery is a source of potential. Um, 
And it's not necessarily a source of constant current. So sometimes people will think that. But no, it is a source of constant potential. The current depends on what I hook up to the battery. <clears throat> so, let's think about that just a little bit. What factors determine how much current we might get in a wire if I hook it up to a battery? Well, we could use the same wire, but different potentials. And with one battery, we would get a certain current. And it's probably not too surprising to you that if we stack two batteries in series, we will get a larger current. Seems pretty reasonable, right? So, greater potential means greater current. Um, how about changing the wire? So here we have same wire, or excuse me, same battery, different wires. Here we have a shorter, fatter wire, and here we have a longer, thinner wire. Well, again, I don't think it's super surprising to learn that the shorter, fatter wire will carry more current than the longer, thinner wire. So, we're now getting to one of the big ideas of this chapter, and that is resistance. The thing that is different between these two, obviously the length and the thickness are different, but the electrical property that that affects is the resistance. This wire has a smaller resistance than this wire does. Therefore, this wire will carry a larger current when hooked to the same battery. Smaller resistance, larger current if hooked to the same battery. Larger resistance, smaller current hooked to the same battery. So, the length and the thickness of a wire affect its resistance, but the material also affects its resistance. So, if we had the same shape of wire, but we had two different materials, for example, one wire of copper and one wire of iron, we would find that the copper conducted more electricity, more current could flow through the copper than through the iron. Why? Because copper, this wire of copper has a lower resistance than this iron wire. You know, here are the, uh, this is the aluminum wire and the copper wire that I showed you in the beginning. Um, these are both the same uh, diameter. Each one of these is six gauge, um, and so they're, they're really thick wires. This one is much lighter than this one. Aluminum is much less dense than copper is. And it turns out that aluminum is not quite as good of a conductor as copper is. Aluminum is lighter and way cheaper but copper is a slightly better conductor. And that's one of the main reasons why electrical wiring in your house is now out of copper and not aluminum. Though they both will work. So, resistance is a measure of how hard it is to push charges through a wire. We use the symbol R for that. A large resistance implies that it is hard to move charges through the wire, and a small resistance implies that it is easy. The current depends on the resistance of the wire and the potential difference between the ends of the wire. So, it takes a potential difference to drive that current. The resistance determines how much current we get. And delta V over R is I. We call this Ohm's Law. It's possibly the most important equation for the next series of chapters. And it defines a relationship between current, potential, and resistance. The unit of resistance is the ohm, which is defined as a volt per amp, and we use this capital omega as our symbol. Um, there's kind of a cute little representation here of this. Ohm's law, of course, is delta V over R equals I, and so this is just a cute little representation, not mine. Uh, the voltage, the potential difference, is what drives the current. That's what's pushing the current. Without the potential difference, we have no current. So the potential difference is driving the current, trying to push the current through the wire. The amps are the current, and ohms are resistance. That's resisting the flow of electricity. <clears throat> to go back to our um, initial discussion on this, recall that those electrons, as they're moving through this wire, they'll have collisions. They'll have collisions with the side of the wire, sure, but mostly they're having collisions with themselves, other electrons. Mostly, though, they're having collisions with the ion cores within the crystal lattice. As they collide with those, they lose some of their kinetic energy, and they transfer that energy to thermal energy of the wire. 
So, so they have a collision with the iron core, with the, excuse me, with the ion core, and it causes it to vibrate. Well, we know that vibrating molecules in a crystal lattice, that's temperature, right? So the, the, uh, the more kinetic energy there is, the higher the temperature. And it's those collisions that really cause this resistance. And typically, and this is sort of a bit beyond the scope of the class, typically uh, resistance goes up with increasing temperature, and resistance goes down with decreasing temperature. And so uh, this is why hardcore gamers get all super um, serious about cooling their computers, because as the temperature of your computer goes up, the resistance of the components goes up, and everything slows down. So keeping your, uh, keeping your computer cool keeps the resistance of all of the components low and helps it to function like it's supposed to. Okay, so... I just told you a minute ago that aluminum has a, it is a little bit not as good of a conductor as copper is. Copper is just a little bit better conductor than aluminum is. Um, now, that was kind of a fast one I pulled because I could easily have a piece of wire made out of aluminum that had a lower resistance than a particular piece of wire made out of copper. In other words, there is something about aluminum and something about copper that is independent of the individual piece, right? This is a specific piece of aluminum. This is a specific piece of copper. But I can make general statements about aluminum and copper. And if I'm making general statements about their ability to conduct electricity, then really what I'm talking about is their resistivity. So resistivity characterizes the electrical properties of materials. So what I really should have said earlier is that aluminum has a higher resistivity than copper does, which means that if you have a wire made of aluminum and a wire made of copper, same shape, same size, the aluminum one will have a higher resistance than the copper one will. Materials that are good conductors have a low resistivity, and materials that are poor conductors have a very high resistivity. So something like plastic would have a very high resistivity. Here's a, a little chart, and you don't need to memorize any of these. It's just kind of give you an idea of the range of resistivity. So copper is one of the better uh, common conductors. Uh, gold is a better conductor, so is silver. Uh, we don't use it to make wires in our walls for obvious reasons. Maybe some people do, I don't know. Um, so copper is a very good conductor. It's about amongst the best conductors of sort of common materials. Um, you can see though that aluminum does have a higher resistivity. Just slightly. It's not way higher, but a bit higher resistivity. It's still a good conductor. Tungsten, this is often used in the filaments of light bulbs. Um, and you can see that by the time we get to iron here, now we're almost a factor of 10 higher resistivity um, than, than copper. Which means that for the, the same current, you'd see 10 times as much heating in that iron, approximately. Um, so, you know, moving along, nichrome, different things here. Seawater, yeah, seawater's kind of in the middle, right? Uh, seawater's not a bad conductor, but it's not a good conductor like copper or aluminum. Um, then you go down here to something that is a poor conductor, like a cell membrane or pure water, and we see very, very high, high resistivities. These are good insulators. These are good conductors. Okay, so how do we connect the resistivity of a substance to the resistance of a particular object. We need this equation here. A wire made of a material of resistivity rho has a length L and a cross section A, and that gives it a resistance given by this equation. R is rho L over A. So resistance is a property of a specific wire, and resistivity is a property of a material. So for example, we could talk about what is the resistivity of aluminum in general. And I could look it up. And if I had 10 pieces of aluminum, they would all have this same resistivity. Now that's different from what is the resistance of this particular wire. If I wanted to know the resistance of this particular wire, I could measure its length, I could measure its cross-sectional area, and then I would have, I can, then I could calculate its resistance. Again, A is the cross-sectional area. So for a standard wire, that is a circular shape. Um, there's no reason why I couldn't give you a square shape or a rectangular shape. Let's do a couple of examples. 
Wire 2 is the same material, but three times the length of wire 1. Which wire has the greatest resistivity? Why don't you pause the video, think about it, I'll see you on the other side. <clears throat> well, this one almost goes into the category of a trick question. Resistivity is a property of the material, not the specific wire. So, um, they are made of the same material, so they have the same resistivity. So, because it's not really a trick question, we just have to be really careful with the wording. What about the question you might have thought I asked? Wire 2 is the same material, but three times the length of wire 1, which has the greater resistance? Okay, well, we want to look at this equation, and we see that the resistance is proportional to the length. So three times the length, we should get three times the resistance. And indeed, we do get a greater resistance with wire 2. I didn't ask you, but specifically, it is three times the resistance. Hmm, here's a little bit trickier one. Wire 2 is twice the length and twice the radius of wire 1. What is the ratio R2 over R1 of their resistances if they are both made of the same material? Why don't you pause the video and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, so the way I'm going to do this is I'm just going to write R1 is rho L over A. Okay, and then what we'll do is we'll write R2 R2, the resistance of the second wire, well, it's made of the same material, and it has twice the length. We have a circular cross-section, so the area of a circle is pi r squared. So, what goes down here? Pi times 2 r A little bit of algebra shows us that, well, we have a 2 on top, we have a 2 squared on the bottom, right? So 2 over 4 is 1 half rho L over A. And so now we can find the ratio they're asking about R2 over R1. And notice that if we do that, we get R2 over R1 is 1. Okay, not too bad. Um, if there's some MCATers out there, some pre-med majors who might be taking the MCAT someday, um, the quick way to do this is, when, this is a very common MCAT type question, the quick way to do this is to plug in the ratios for the things you know are changing and ignore the things that are not changing. You'll get a number out and that is your ratio. So for example, in the case of wire two, both rho and uh, for wire 1 and wire 2 are the same. The length doubles, so what I would do here is I would write a 2 on top. The area, well, we know that goes as pi r squared. Both of them have pi. Our r doubles, so that would end up being 2 squared on the bottom because of our r squared, right, on the bottom. And we would end up with 1 half, and that is the ratio between them. Okay, so, um, you know, that's just a, a quick way to roll through this if this was an MCAT question. Okay, so here we have a light bulb, a 100 watt light bulb, and it carries 0.83 amps at the normal operating voltage of 120 volts. What is the filament resistance is the first question. Okay, well, let's check that out. So the filament resistance is going to be given by Ohm's law. And of course, I equals delta V over R is Ohm's law. We'll want to go ahead and solve this for R. And it tells us it's 120 volts and it's carrying 0.83 amps. That gives us a resistance of 145 volts. Not too bad. Fairly straightforward calculation. Um, and you'll find that 
generally with Ohm's law, the calculations are straightforward. The application can be tricky, right? It's just three numbers. We're going to be dividing or multiplying two of them. Um, but it's, it's the application that can be tricky. Um, okay, so let's look at part B. If the filament is made of tungsten wire of diameter 0 0.035 millimeters, how long is the filament? Okay, so for this one, this was part A, for B, what we want to do is use this equation. And we're looking for the length. And so we can solve for the length there. And then all we really need to do is plug in our numbers. Again, we'll assume we have a round cross section. And we can just plug in our numbers. L equals R, which is our resistance. That's our 145 ohms. A, well, that's pi times r squared, and you know what, I'm just going to do this, 0 0.035 times 10 to the negative third over 2 squared, and that's all over our resistivity, which we just have to look up. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to get out our... Um, our textbook, or if you use Mastering Physics, there's that link called Constants. If you click on that button, it will take you to the various tables that we use, um, including this one. And so I believe it told us we had a tungsten filament, and we should probably, what, use... Our light bulb is hot when it's running, right? So we should probably use this one. So that's 5 times 10 to the negative 7. And our units are ohms times meters. Okay, so now again, we are looking for how long is the filament. Uh, we now have all of our info. Let's go ahead and run our calculator. And we get 28 centimeters, or 0 0.28 meters. Okay, so it's something like that. It's really, honestly, kind of surprising. It's pretty long to be tied, coiled up into a little tiny, tiny loop like that. Um, and you can see that this kind of coils upon coils here, isn't there? So these are all typical numbers, fairly typical though.